One of the first people to write about this painting described it as a woman in a blouse playing a lute with the music sheets in front of her. Well, he got the lute right and the blouse and the music sheets, but the lute player with the elegant, effeminate hands is not a girl. And therein lies one of the many ambiguities that surround the painting and the life of the man who painted it. He was Michelangelo Merisi, more commonly known by the name of the Italian town where he was born, Caravaggio. He painted the lute player about the year 1596 when he was 25. According to a contemporary, Caravaggio once called it the most beautiful picture he ever painted. The lute player is a boy. Caravaggio's early pictures show a strong liking for these languidly beautiful creatures who occupy a kind of borderland between the two sexes. As he gazes at us, he pauses, his fingers poised over the strings. The music has stopped for a moment, so we can admire the musician and piece together what exactly is going on. From the music sheets in front of him, we know he's been singing as well as playing. It's a madrigal. Even the man who wrote it can be traced, a popular composer from the Netherlands by the name of Arkadelt. A few of the words are legible. The large capital V. Voi sapete chio vamo. You know that I love you. Lutes were associated with erotic music. Shakespeare wrote of the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But then, a violin. The invitation is clear. Someone else is to accompany the lute player. The artist? Or by implication, us? The invitation becomes more blatant on the left of the picture. The symbolism of fruit would have been lost on no one at the time, particularly when they included figs. Even Caravaggio's preference for fruit that's damaged and soiled may carry a reference to the nature of human love as he perceived it. Love ripens and decays. We damage what we touch. Perfection is a dream. Flowers carry the same message. Beautiful for a brief lifespan, then fading. Although in the context of the lute player's invitation, they may also be seen as the traditional messengers of love. Lovers bring flowers to those they desire. Caravaggio had homosexual tastes, as did the man who commissioned the picture, along with several others. He was Cardinal Del Monte, diplomat, aesthete, friend of Galileo, and a faithful servant of the Medicis in Rome. Ideals of beauty were a preoccupation of Italian painters, as they had been to the artists of classical Greece. But Caravaggio turned his back on such ideals. The closer you look at this lute player, the more the boy's face becomes not so much beautiful as intensely real, nothing idealized at all. The setting is contrived, but not the figure itself. An early biographer, inquiring after the artist in Rome, wrote that Caravaggio believed all art to be a mere bagatelle unless it was done after life. Rather more outlandish, another early painting, again bought by Cardinal Del Monte. The figure is Bacchus, a more foppish youth than the lute player and even more androgynous, bordering on the absurd, with his headgear of vines and pseudo-classical toga like a bathing wrap, but again brilliant in colouring and meticulous in detail. The god of wine holds out his goblet a little unsteadily as though he may spill it, and as with the lute player, it looks like an invitation. And again echoing the lute player, a still life of fruit even more overripe, like the figure of Bacchus himself. The pomegranate on the right is split open. The peaches are bruised almost to decay. The grapes spill out of the dish. It's a painting about hedonism and excess. How seriously Caravaggio intended to evoke the world of Greek myth and Olympian gods is doubtful. The guise looks little more than a pretext for putting a chubby boy in fancy dress, too realistic to be credible as myth. And here, precisely, lies the picture's perverse and hypnotic charm. It is serious high camp. We take it at face value. 
If the boy smiled, all would be ruined. Nothing in Caravaggio's early work suggests that almost overnight he was to become one of the greatest religious painters. The subject, the supper at Emmaus, the moment when Christ reveals himself to two disciples at a village inn on the day of his resurrection. The disciple on the right may be St. James, to judge from the scallop shell he wears. The second disciple, Cleopas, is about to rise from his chair in astonishment at recognizing the stranger who is dining with them. Christ's own gesture suggests a blessing of their wine and bread. Only the innkeeper has no idea what is happening. The force of Caravaggio's painting comes from two devices, gesture and dramatic lighting. The brilliant light turns the setting into a stage on which a drama is being enacted in the mind. Gestures perform a mime of that interior drama. At the same time, transforming the scene of a plain table laid with food into a holy sacrament. And the outstretched hands seem to draw us in to share this moment of revelation. Caravaggio's women, unlike his soft-featured men, can be terrifying. The old hag here is a maid. Her mistress in this story from the biblical apocrypha is the Jewish heroine Judith. The familiar dramatic lighting picks out her ferocious face, her white dress, and this white arm reaching out through the darkness to commit a bloodthirsty act of murder. With a sword, she strikes off the head of the Assyrian general Holofernes, whose army has been laying siege to the Jewish city. All Caravaggio's love of dramatic effects and themes of violent death are present here. Other artists show Judith merely holding up the severed head. Caravaggio gives us the moment of murder. Two stories run parallel in this painting. The one illustrated is the biblical tale, Judith, the rich and beautiful widow who saved her people by working her charms on the enemy general, plying him with drink, then drawing her sword. The other story is Caravaggio's own, the artist whose violent nature was to lead him within a few years to kill a man in a quarrel and become a fugitive from the law until his lonely and early death, waiting for a reprieve, in 1610. Caravaggio's art was exceptionally close to his own life, perilously so. At other times, as in the lute player, lovingly so. The enigma of such contrast seems baffling between sadistic violence and pretty boys playing love songs. Cardinal Del Monte, his early patron who commissioned the lute player, described him as an extremely capricious sort of man. No sign of that here. Voi sapete chio vamo. Or here, the bouquet of mixed flowers, an echo of Netherlandish paintings in vogue at the time. Wonderfully painted details of still life. Even those who disapproved of Caravaggio's realism praised his technical skill. It's also possible that the picture was intended to be an illustration of the five senses. The boy's hands on the lute representing both touch and sound. Caravaggio's images speak to us more directly than those of any other painter of his time. He was a painter on his own, and like so many artists on their own, he inspired a multitude of followers. <laughs> 